ask questions like what happened before the Big Bang, uh, what is the nature of time, and then you go to quantum physics, what's the nature of reality, and uh, then you go to life, what is life, and then what is consciousness, you know, all those things which I love to think about. You can't think about those without coming up against those same age-old questions that for centuries were part of religion. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I am thrilled to welcome to the Into the Impossible podcast a legendary uh, cosmologist, a physicist, uh, an author, an intellectual, and a scholar who was my last guest live in person uh, before the pandemic set in in January uh, 2020. He was gracious enough to come to UCSD and did an event uh, with one of the Benford boys. I always mix up if it's Greg or if it's James, but uh, no mind. We talked about whether or not ET is lurking in our cosmic backyard. And uh, we had a great discussion about one of Paul's great books from at that time, it was a 10 year old book, I believe. Uh, and that was about the eerie silence. And today he's back with a new book and it is called what is eating, not Keating, what is eating the universe. <laughs> and uh, I want to understand as we often want to be told not to do, Paul, the advice is often saying, don't judge a book by its cover, but I want to judge this book by its cover. Uh, how did you come up with the title and the cover design, which is actually quasi three-dimensional? I mean, it, it actually opens up. It's, it's, it's quite beautiful. So tell us, Paul, what, what is the origin of this very provocative and uh, whimsical title? Uh, well, uh, Brian, uh, let me first say that I'm just the author, so I had no choice over the cover. <laughs> uh, I thought it was quite a clever idea to uh, cut the holes in the in the jacket uh, to sort of expose the universe behind, so I, I, I like it. Um, but as far as the title is concerned, What's Eating the Universe? So uh, this book, I should say, uh, was my lockdown creation. Uh, I'd intended to write the book anyway, but the lockdown accelerated it. Wasn't it wonderful? We were we're all confined to quarters uh, with nothing much else to do and all the foreign travel cancelled. And so I thought, well, I'll just bash on and finish this book. So it's come out six months ahead of uh, what it was supposed to. Um, and, the, and it started out really as a collection of uh, chapters, each of which uh, deals with some aspect of cosmology. Uh, and let me just uh, preface that by saying that I've lived through what I call the golden age of cosmology. I've had a front row seat during that time. Uh, I think cosmology moved from when I was a student to be, think, being a speculative backwater of science to really a mainstream precision science. We can mm. measure so many things. But like all golden ages, brought its successes, but also opened up lots of new questions and mysteries. And I wanted this to be both a celebration of the amazing achievements that have occurred during my career, but also uh, to, to show that for any young people thinking of going into science and uh, fascinated by the universe, there's still plenty of things left to do. And it's not impossible that some of these anomalies, the things that don't quite fit, uh, will fundamentally transform our understanding of the large scale structure of the universe. And what's eating the universe is one of the chapters. We decided uh, that publisher and I decided that it was probably a good title to give to the book, but it's just one of a number of, of mysteries that are being discussed. And it really has to do with, uh, to be quite specific, a funny patch in the southern hemisphere, a cold patch in the sky, that uh, the entire universe is bathed in heat radiation, the fading afterglow of the Big Bang. And the extraordinary thing about this fading afterglow is that it's, uh, it shows us, uh, it's a, like a snapshot of the universe in its very early stages, and it shows us that the universe was almost totally pristine, a sort of flawless, perfect baby, uh, but with one or two scars or blemishes, and one of these blemishes is uh, this patch in the southern hemisphere, which is uh, cooler than the rest, cooler than it's supposed to be, and uh, one particular cosmologist, Laura Massini Houghton, had speculated that uh, it's almost as if a cosmic giant has taken a bite out of the universe, speculated it might be because another universe has bumped into ours and has left a scar, uh, or might even be swallowing ours, or 
um, there are other ways in which the universe can be swallowed. So that seemed like, you know, a really fun topic to give to the title of the book. Uh, and so that's that's really where it came from. <laughs> and it is a delightfully whimsical book. It's really a collection of essays in, in a certain sense uh, that uh, I found quite uh you know, bewitching and, and enticing to read. It was an easy, fast read for me, and I was gratified to see even some data from the BICEP2 uh, experiment that I played a role in uh, way back when. And I want to uh, start there because you have had such a such a uh, profound influence, not just on me as a as a physicist, but on on all of physics and cosmology. You've interacted with and created uh, some of the greatest uh, works that are pertinent, more pertinent than ever in addition to your outreach. But I want to start there with uh, today's news. I don't know if you heard it. Uh, it's Neutrino News, and it comes out of the Microboon experiment. Uh, we're recording this in late October 2021. I don't know when this will be out. Uh, but as of today, there is no evidence for sterile neutrinos from the Microboon experiment. And I wanted to, uh, to kind of get your take on these things, because there are several anomalies that are described at lovingly uh, intense levels of detail, but popular, uh, accessible to a popular audience as well, uh, which is rare that you have a book that appeals to experts like me and the lay audience. But anyway, what do you make of these proliferation of hints, of crises, of, of you know, of, of anomalies. As Steven Weinberg said once, physics thrives on crises. Luckily, today, there aren't so many. And that was back in 1989. <laughs> we have an, a, we're living in a golden age of crises. Uh, what do you make of, uh, of this? And in particular, the lack of, of finding um, of this sterile neutrino, uh, you know, evidence or hint today. Uh, well, uh, I'm not up to date with the news about the sterile neutrino, but let me first make a very general comment in case people are wondering. We've, we've flipped from talking about a big hole in the universe to talking about the, one of the tiniest things we can imagine. Uh, the, the great point about our understanding of the universe is that it really combines the very large and the very small. And so uh, sometimes it's said that the Big Bang was the greatest particle physics experiment ever conducted. And our understanding of how the universe is shaped, uh, what it's made of, and what it's going to do uh, is, in large part, uh, dependent on our understanding of uh, quantum mechanics and particle physics and the, the physics of the very small, of which neutrinos form a part. And so uh, when you talk about you know, crises and anomalies, uh, they really come in these two categories, things like a you know, funny patch in the sky uh, doesn't seem quite right, and also things in the realm of particle physics. And now let me just, again, be quite general about particle physics. Uh, there's something that we call the standard model. It's been around for some decades. And it's a sort of um, patch-up job. It's a halfway house at an attempted unification of all the fundamental particles and forces of physics. And uh, in a way, it's... Uh, part of the program that began two and a half millennia ago in ancient Greece, the idea that the universe is made of some fundamental building blocks uh, and that everything that happens uh, is simply the rearrangement of these building blocks. And, and that's all there is, uh, the, the, the building blocks and the void. Uh, they called the building blocks atoms, but today we know the things we call atoms today are not the fundamental blocks, but we can go down a few layers. And then we get a whole bunch of things like, you know, quarks and leptons and uh, and, uh, you know, I won't bother to enumerate them all, except some of them have quixotic uh, names. And, and I, uh, in the book, say that many physicists have their favorite particle, of which mine is the, the graviton. But, but that's uh, by the by. The point is uh, that this is not a totally disordered mishmash of particles and forces. There seems to be a mathematical unity there. Um, and over the, uh, well, the decades, really, uh, there's been a sort of convergence in the, uh, in all these disparate things, we used to think uh, when I was a student, there were particles being discovered, uh, you know, every week. Nobody knew what to call them. Um, nobody understood how they fitted together. We now understand that, that, that there is a, an underlying mathematical scheme. But, uh, it, you know, there's a way to go yet. And some of the things uh, we uh, encounter and have encountered for a while don't fit into that scheme, don't fit into the standard model. Uh, one of these, for example, is neutrino mass. So mm -hmm. we, we know of uh, three types of neutrinos that we're definite about, um, and uh, they and they are known to have uh, tiny masses. And uh, the standard model of particle physics has no mechanism to assign them masses. So we know there is some physics beyond the standard model. Uh, the other 
area that uh, is, I would say, is now an anomaly, is that um, there's a, a sort of firm belief. I mean, it's really a faith, I think, mm -hmm. among theoretical physicists that the two great classes of particles, fermions and um, bosons, these are the particles of matter uh, on the one hand and the particles that convey the forces of nature on the other hand, that they should somehow be combined together into a single mathematical scheme. And that scheme was worked out years ago. It's called supersymmetry. And when the Large Hadron Collider was built uh, in Switzerland to make the Higgs boson, famously did make it, uh, there was a general expectation that in the lead up to making the Higgs boson, uh, it would also make supersymmetric partner particles. That is that for every boson, there would be a, a corresponding lepton, and for every lepton, there would be a corresponding boson, and that at least uh, one of these particles would manifest itself. Well, that hasn't happened. Uh, and so what are we to make of that? Does it mean that the that supersymmetry is not a symmetry of nature after all? Uh, or does it mean that we need a bigger and better uh, accelerator in order to uh, access the energies at which these super partners might, uh, might appear? Nobody knows that, but it clearly, that, you know, that is one flaw in, uh, in our understanding. There are others as well uh, having to do uh, with the possibility of new particles, which are being... Uh, the, for which there is some suggested, uh, suggestive evidence, uh, nothing uh, definitive. Um, and, um, uh, and just a, a general uh, despair would be overstating it, but frustration that the, the force of nature that we most notice, which is gravitation, it's what keeps our force of feet on the ground, uh, doesn't have a slick unification with the other forces of nature. Mm. Uh, so it's like uh, an add-on. It's almost as if, you know, God created the universe and all these particles and three forces of nature and then as an afterthought threw in gravitation but hadn't quite figured out how to combine it with the others. And, and, we, ha and we haven't figured that out, although there's some, some famous candidate theories. So there's a lot still to be done and a lot of things uh, don't fit in. Uh, and one other thing that I suppose I should mention is an obvious I suppose anomaly, but uh, you read about it so often it doesn't seem very anomalous. And that's dark matter, that we know the stuff of which you and I are made and the stars, uh, are, uh, atoms basically, uh, is only a tiny fraction of all the matter that is out there. And uh, what is called dark matter, well, there are plenty of theoretical candidates for what it might be, uh, but so far nobody knows. We can see its effects from its gravitational pull, uh, but again, we would hope that something like a dark matter particle, uh, which would be very weakly interacting, be like neutrinos, but much more massive, uh, would show up at the Large Hadron Collider, some, some clue at least as to what dark matter might be. So far, nothing. So we're left in the, literally in the dark about dark matter, about neutrino masses and any possible additional neutrinos and, uh, uh, and a host of other oddities um, about particle physics, uh, as well as the large-scale structure of the universe. Some, somehow yeah. it's all going to be fitted together. <laughs> um, and I want to make reference to a, a spinoff from the book, which describes even just the question of if there's a proliferation of particles and, you know, uh, the famous words of Wolfgang Pauli, con, you know, conceiver of the neutrino, you know, who ordered that? Uh, and then later the, the saying that the Nobel Prize should go to the first person who doesn't discover a new particle. <laughs> now we've moved on from a merely conjecturing and discovering new particles to actually invoking the existence of new forces. So we hear a lot about fifth forces and so forth. Uh, and you even mentioned in the book, the uh, G minus two anomaly, uh, et cetera. And I thought, you know, maybe we could get into uh, to, to a discussion of whether or not there are four forces, five forces. You say the list of particles I have that I've introduced in this chapter raises the question of why. Is there a deeper reason for the list to be populated in just this way by just those particles and just those masses, electric charges and spins? And is there something magical about four, or as you just said, really three basic forces rather than five or 50 or 500? Um, I was taught, Paul, by uh, by many eminent uh, scientists in my career that you should never ask why as a scientist. <laughs> you should only ask what, how, when, um, you know, et cetera. But, uh, but you asked this question. I want to ask it back to you. What do you mean by why? Is that a legitimate uh, question to, for legitimate physicists such as yourself to even countenance ask it? 
Oh, well, of course, you, you could ask what you like. And I, and I uh, strongly encourage uh, that scientists should ask the why question, even if we know that in coming up with explanations, we're, we're really dealing with the how, because uh, it, why, why is, of course, a rather ill-defined term, uh, but it very often carries the connotation of, uh, of purpose. You know, wh why did you do that? Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and if we're caught out doing something we shouldn't, then we come up with excuses. Right, or why can't I do that? And the parent always has to say, because, because I said so. <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, but, uh, but there is um, uh, a subtext to this. And it's one I've been involved with for my entire career. And the, the older I get, the more I feel it's significant that, we, that human beings uh, try to make sense of the world. We live in a universe which is not just, it appears, a rag bag of odds and ends. It does appear to be a sort of coherent scheme of things. And indeed, you wouldn't embark on the scientific enterprise in the first place if you didn't feel that there was a sort of rational and intelligible order beneath the surface phenomena of nature. And to dig out that order, this is a non-trivial thing. You don't just look around you and say, oh, I can see this, I, I can see that, I see how it all fits together. It's not apparent at all. So nobody would have ever discovered neutrinos or the Higgs boson just by casual inspection of the world. Mm. You'd never know they even existed. So we have these arcane procedures of you know, building weird machines and doing peculiar stuff to matter that maybe has never been done before and, and writing funny symbols on blackboards and bits of paper and sort of figuring out how the world works. And it's been just spectacularly successful. We've had, what, three and a half centuries of really doing much more than just describing the world. That's not what theoretical physics does. It, just, it doesn't just give an account of the world. It explains the world. It leads mm. to an understanding. We, uh, if you look at, for example, you could ask, uh, here we go with a why question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, why uh, are there electromagnetic waves? You know, we know light is an electromagnetic waves. So why are there wave-like uh, solutions? of the equations. Uh, well, you sit down, you look at the equations, you, you manipulate them, you solve them, and out comes the familiar uh, equation for a wave. And so that gives you an answer. And then you look at that and you think, aha, now I understand why there are electromagnetic waves. Well, in a sense, that's asking, uh, you know, how is it that they come about? OK, mm. fair enough. But you see the point of, about asking the why questions. It leads you to that aha moment that Ah, I've got it now. I see how it's put together. And we would like to believe, I'm sure all of us are sort of driven by this passion to explain the world, um, that there are reasons for why things are as they are, that there would be you know, three generations of particles and all of these other things, that uh, if we work a bit harder, there will be that aha moment. Now it all makes sense. Uh, but of course, it's only an act of faith. It may be that the universe doesn't actually make sense or it doesn't make sense to a human being, after all what we call common sense and what we arrive at as understanding is something that has been selected by uh, evolution, that uh, we've evolved uh, through natural selection to survive in the proverbial jungle. And yet we're equipped with this cognitive ability uh, to not just observe the world, but to uh, understand it at this deeper level of reality. I consider that pretty stupendous. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it may be we just had a dream run, uh, that we've had a few centuries where we've been really good at this, and we're going to soon hit a brick wall and the whole enterprise will grind to a halt. I really hope that isn't the case. I really do think we can go further and that there is some, some underlying order that we're not, not quite getting, that, that we're missing at this stage, and that's for the next generation. Uh, we, we need help to mm -hmm. understand what's going on. And when we think about, you know, kind of the, the goals in a teleological driven physics, you know, oftentimes we are at a loss because we want to connect, you know, the reasons, as you're saying, for these phenomena with, with something that we can A, comprehend and maybe even B, measure. But I want to ask, you know, you've had such an illustrious career and I've never seen you as a as a fad or, you know, fashionable uh, chaser as, as, uh, yeah, as, as our friend uh, Sir Roger Penrose calls, you know, fads and fantasies and fallacies in physics, uh, past guest on the show. And I want to, I want to ask you though, as a, as a theorist, you know, speaking to an experimentalist like me, 
how do you know when to take a hint from an experimentalist seriously? In other words, we come up with uh, experiments to test theories primarily. Sometimes we discover things serendipitously, like the uh, the CMB ball sitting behind me was discovered serendipitously in 1965, as you talk about. And but. Nevertheless, most of what we do is driven by some teleological purpose that uh, physicists such as yourself and other colleagues um, have come up with ideas for how the universe, how that pattern got there. And we set out to design tests to uh, unravel perhaps the relic radiation in the form of gravitational waves to maybe indicate the presence of a hyperluminal expansion called inflation. We'll get into inflation and your contributions to it in a minute. But what is it that allows you to have the taste, the good taste, and the good sense that you have, as I hope to instill in my students to have good taste to know which theories to investigate? How do you know when to, to risk your credibility on something like, you know, the G minus two? Or recently there was a um, there was a hint in my field of, of cosmic birefringence and polarization rotation at the 2.5 sigma level. Last week there was a hint from the uh, Large Hadron Collider beauty experiment, LHC, lower case B. Uh, we'll be talking with Harry Cliff about that soon. And uh, and that was like a 1.5 sigma effect. <laughs> um, you know, but and yet when BICEP came out, there were 700 papers, you know, to, uh, explaining how we could have gotten such a large tensor to scalar ratio. None by you, I should point out. But anyway, Paul, can you explain uh, your rubric? Is there a rubric that an eminent person such as yourself would use to delineate what is worth my, you know, spending or wasting um, a considerable amount of my most precious resource, my time, on a, on a new experimental hint. Right. Well, there's a pompous answer to that, and it's the application of Bayes' rule. Uh, of course, uh, so Bayes' rule tells you you have to assign some uh, prior probability mm. that a particular theory or idea uh, is going to be correct, mm. and then you update it uh, in the light of the experiment. And, uh, and I'll give you a very simple example that I'm often involved in, uh, that uh, you know, have we discovered life on Mars? Uh, so you know, wouldn't that be great? Uh, and uh, I'm often asked, you know, there's some little hint of evidence. Uh, does that mean there's life on Mars? Uh, and I say, well, you know, if you do Bayes' rule, uh, in my view, uh, the because Earth and Mars trade rocks all the time, they could trade microbes. And so uh, I think uh, it's almost inevitable that there will be life on Mars, if only because it got there from Earth. Um, but if you think that a life arose independently on Earth and Mars, uh, well, the probability of life uh, arising de novo from a mishmash of chemicals could be exceedingly small, in which case you'd need very strong evidence uh, that you had found life on Mars. So, so that's part of it. Um, in practice, of course, uh, unlike you, I have the luxury of being able to do uh, you know, cancer biology in the morning, cosmology in the afternoon, and quantum physics in, in the evening. And um, my research moves at the speed of thought. Uh, and I don't need to apply for a large research grant and build equipment and, uh, you know, hire people to uh, s service the lab and all that sort of stuff. And so uh, that makes it uh, very easy to be agile. But in terms of um, ma making decisions, uh, so there's a large element of luck, I have to say. So I worked um, in... I, let, let me just give you a little bit of, you know, you can t tell... Uh, how old I am, because, you know, I keep reminiscing about uh, the glory days of the past. But it, it actually is significant in answering your question, because um, I went to Cambridge University as a postdoc of Fred Hoyle, the cosmologist, in, mm -hmm. in 1970. And, uh, you, you know, the lads down the corridor, and there was only one female um, mm -hmm. a, a postdoc at that time, included... Um, Stephen Hawking and uh, Martin Rees and uh, Jim Hartle, and, you know, the sort of roll call of they are the great and the good, uh, but they were just um, just my colleagues uh, and working on uh, various things. And this is relevant to answering your question in two ways, uh, because one is that Martin Rees uh, was strongly influential on me uh, for the reason that he occupies that sort of intermediate position between theory and, in astronomy's case, it's more observation than experiment. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would always figure, can I take this seriously? Uh, you know, what about that point of view? And I would go to him, and, and I would feel that if he said it's 
okay, take it seriously, or if he said, don't take it seriously, that, that was very good. But so mm -hmm. ha having the, those people who can act as a bridge between the, the, the hard end of the science and of the experiment and observation and the sort of airy-fairy theory, uh, those people are extremely useful. Uh, mm. And I, I'm really grateful, and he remains a, a good friend of mine all these years on. Yeah. Uh, and then the other person, Stephen Hawking. Now, this is a curious thing, because at that time, uh, I was uh, interested... In, uh, uh, for my PhD, I uh, worked on something called the Wheeler-Feynman theory of electrodynamics. So this is an attempt to explain um, why we see only retarded electromagnetic radiation, roughly speaking, why... Uh, radio waves are received after they're sent and not before, right. even though the fundamental equations of electromagnetism are time symmetric. And uh, Fred Hoyle, who I went to work with, had connected that uh, through this uh, Wheeler-Feynman theory of electrodynamics, which is time symmetric, has advanced and retarded waves, had connected it up with cosmology and the structure of the universe. And he thought that only in the steady state theory would you get retarded electromagnetic waves. Turned out that wasn't true, but that's not the point. The point is that um, I, that's what I worked on for my PhD, and it connected the large and the small. I thought it was wonderful that something uh, that uh, told us about radio emissions from the local station would connect to the structure of the universe. Same, same with Mach's principle. I was always fascinated. Mm. So then, um, towards the end of my PhD, which is in the late 1960s, um, I noticed uh, a number of people working on a very obscure backwater of science, which was if you apply quantum physics, in particular quantum field theory, um, in an expanding universe, it looked like particles got created. So I thought, well, is that how all the matter came into the universe in the Big Bang? You know, was it just uh, some sort of um, quantum vacuum uh, disturbance, something like that? Uh, that turns out that wasn't the case, but I was sort of intrigued. But the the effects seemed to be so tiny that it didn't look like anyone else would be interested. And so I, I worked on, you know, par particle creation in expanding universes, a famous paper by Leonard Parker at that time, um, and, and, and also applying quantum physics to black holes. I thought, you know, there might be some, some value in that, but it all seemed incredibly theoretical. And this was totally transformed when Stephen Hawking then in 1974, came up with his um, idea that black holes are not black but glow with heat radiation by applying quantum physics to it. Um, and that was something that sort of threw me at the time because mm. I thought, well, I've been thinking about this for a little while. Um, I'd never discussed that with Stephen, but we had talked a little bit about um, the particle creation and expanding universes. Um, but uh, really, this sort of came out of the blue. And I thought, well, how can it be the case? Because a black hole, you know, the Schwarzschild solution of a black hole is time symmetric. How can there be a flux of radiation? Because I was already working on my book, The Physics of Time Asymmetry, The Arrow mm -hmm. of Time. So it seemed to sort of fly in the face of that. And it took me a, a few weeks of uh, head scratching before I could get that aha moment. Now I, now I see what's going on here, that there is a, you break the time uh, symmetry of the system with the collapse of the star, you see. So even though a black hole might have been around for billions of years and is glowing, that glow uh, reflects the disruption to the quantum vacuum billions of years ago. It's an extraordinary thing that it's like the fading grin of the Cheshire cat living on after all that time. Took a while to figure that out. Um, uh, but um, uh, you see, because I was sort of in on the ground floor of that and then worked I went to King's College in London uh, to the mathematics department, had a lot of good students and postdocs, and, and we worked on going beyond what Leonard Parker had done and trying to work out, um, you know, the, the big problem you can talk in quantum mechanics, you can use particle language, and people do. Mm. They talk about particles being created from the vacuum and all that sort of stuff. But if you're interested in gravitation, you don't want particles. What you want is... Uh, this thing called the stress energy momentum tensor. Think energy, really. That, you know, mass gravitates, uh, energy is a form of mass. It's more complicated than that in Einstein's general theory of relativity. It's a st the whole stress energy momentum tensor you need. And when you work that out in quantum physics, you find you get uh, the unhappy answer of infinity. Um, and, uh, and the reason for that is just because even in a vacuum, uh, that you, the, there's a, a sort of irreducible level 
of quantum energy which is flitting around and when you tot it all up it's it's actually divergent, it's infinite. So we had to develop some techniques for taming that, for getting sensible finite results. And again, it looked to us in the, I'm talking mid 70s, late 70s, uh, as very much a theoretical exercise with largely thinking about how do you explain how black holes lose mass? Mm. Because negative energy flows in, as we found. Right. Um, but also, you know, applying it to the expanding universe, just, uh, you know, completing the program that Leonard Parker had begun. And it was really more, um, I still thought it was a backwater, more of a sort of elegant uh, enterprise than anything that would have application. And then, bang, in the 1980s, along came the inflationary scenario of the early universe, that it, it leapt in size by an enormous factor in the first split second, a, a, a phase of exponential expansion, and we'd done all that stuff. Mm -hmm. We'd looked at a quantum vacuum in an expanding, exponentially expanding space-time, uh, sort of ready with the answer. Um, and so it, I was very fortunate that these things turned out to, to find application. To, to, and to be perfectly honest, um, by the time all this was settling down in the mid-80s and everyone was dashing off into string theory, and I thought about that and I, all my colleagues seemed obsessed with it and I really didn't want to go down that path. Um, uh, and then I began to turn my attention to other topics. I thought, well, I'm sort of bored 10 or 15 years doing quantum fields in curved space. You know, I, I started getting interested in the origin of life. And, and I must say in passing, and I'm talking a lot here, but in passing, that was also Martin Rees, I have to thank for that. Because in 1983, he held a meeting in Cambridge called From Matter to Life. And of course, I'd read Schrodinger's little book about what is life uh, and viewed through the eyes of a physicist. You know, it looks like magic. And, uh, and after that conference, I thought, well, you know, it's even more like magic than I thought. But, but I don't believe in magic, so there have to be mechanisms we don't understand. The physics of living matter is something that needs uh, a lot more work and a lot more thought. And uh, that became a sort of hobby uh, that, uh, fast forward to now, it's uh, very much dominating my thoughts. So I've been able to sort of move across all across the map. Uh, and, and maybe that's been to my disadvantage. Maybe if I stayed mm. in some narrow area and just kept plugging away uh, <laughs> and re-emphasizing contributions and so on, um, you know, I might, have, I might have had greater glory if that's what we're after. I don't know what <laughs> we're after as practicing scientists. But, I, but, you know, I'm really pleased to have such diverse interests and to be able to... To, to move across these these different subjects and disciplines. So could could you clarify for for us, you know, the rubric that one might apply, at least deriving from what you just said or distilling it, is really one based on kind of discursive curiosity. It seems to me that you're just relentlessly curious. And I always say that, you know, passion is kind of like a spark. It's important to ignite you know, a rocket or something, but the real fuel is curiosity. And it seems like the thing that characterized you said at the beginning of this, of this answer uh, was, you know, curiosity, everything from cancer to the cosmos uh, and, and everything in between. And, uh, but, but there's always a through line, which I think I, I see in you a, a reluctance to work on, I wouldn't say trivial in the sense of uh, boring or, or unimportant, but um, you, you have done work that's foundational and fundamental, as you just mentioned, um, <clears throat> but you like to take on the very grand and, and you're not averse to talking about big picture topics in philosophy and even theology, which we'll get into. Um, not that you're the only physicist. I mean, many, many from Einstein, Galileo, Newton, et cetera, have, have uh, gotten into these. But, you know, from the from the standpoint of a of a, you know, of a practicing workaday theorist, uh, at some level, it's important to to go deep. And sometimes you have to go broad. And I guess the question is, uh, are you unique? Is it is is there something to be learned from Paul Davies <laughs> or is it just that you have this gift, this you know discursive curiosity, as I called it? Um, or are there ways to uh, for my audience and people that might be young, th aspiring theoretical or experimental physicists? Is there a tool? Is there a, a technique? to find the nugget of uh, uh, of the most interesting kernel uh, uh, that, that one could pursue? Or is it sometimes just a matter of serendipity or luck? Well, as I've mentioned, there is an element of luck, but there are certain guiding uh, principles. Um, one of these is, uh, yeah, curiosity is, of course, important. I'm very tolerant of pretty way out ideas. And, the, and mm. you can be tolerant, but skeptical. Mm. It's really important you say, well, I don't think this is actually 
right. Um, but you know, tell tell me how you think it is, and uh, you know, I will I will uh, pay some attention. So that's one thing. The other thing is for young people. Uh, it uh, and it's uh, I think it's probably worse now than when I was uh, uh, embarking on my career. Uh, is uh, that if you sort of go off into the weeds and um, uh, and don't establish a reputation in some sort of mainstream discipline, it's it's actually very hard to build a career. And uh, I, I benefit uh, very greatly from my collaboration here at Arizona State University with Sarah Walker. Uh, yeah. and, and Sarah, I can tell, I knew her as a PhD student. I could tell she shared my passion for, uh, you know, all of these wonderful questions. And she came on a, a NASA astrobiology postdoc to work with me and we wanted to solve the problem of life's origin and we're still working on that. Um, uh, but the, the advice I gave her, and I think it's very sound and it's worked very well in her case, is that, you know, devote about half of your time to sort of just good solid contributions at a technical level, I mean in her case it's all theory, at a technical level uh, to you know, some sort of mainstream topic that will get, the papers will be published, people will pay attention and so on. Then the other half, you can sort of go off into this, um, you know, ne never, never land uh, of these, these really big questions. And she's, she's done that very well. I, I saw in her 10 years ago, uh, a younger version of myself mm. uh, at that age. I recognized, you know, that sort of passion to, uh, to really get to grips with things. But it, it's not just a matter of, well, you follow up somebody else's ideas. We need new ideas. Mm. And she's been very good at saying, we're thinking about this all the wrong way. Uh, we should, th this is the concept we need, or we should try this out, or try that way of looking at it. Um, and, and so that would be my advice to mm. any dr dreamers uh, <laughs> who are listening to these words, uh, that, that they d you know, don't neglect your sort of mainstream stuff. And, and, and for me, that, that worked well. The other thing is, uh, of course, in any sort of university setting, uh, there is a small matter of students. <laughs> they're around. They're important. Uh, I love them. Uh, they have to be taught. Uh, and so uh, some attention needs to be given to just uh, those sort of housekeeping issues, giving good, inspiring lectures, uh, well put together, uh, and all the other sort of university administration things. So that aspect of, of one's career can't be neglected. Uh, there are very few scientists who have really made it big time by sort of going off and living lives as hermits uh, and doing groundbreaking work. Uh, if you're <laughs> part of the community, you've got to play by the community rules. Very good. Uh, I very much appreciate that. And I agree about Sarah. She's an inspiration to me and she's uh, just so tremendously energetic and um, and thoughtful and considerate. Uh, and like you, as you say, uh, she's well, she's influencing you. So I, I, I don't think it's uh, patronizing in any way, but she is only interested in the biggest picture topics. And I really respect that. And um, I've had her colleague on Lee Cronin uh, from Glasgow, and I hope to have Sarah on as well. Uh, I want to talk about uh, some of the deep dives that we got into in this book. And you have just, uh, again, you know, I'm sorry to just keep praising you with high praise, not faint praise, but strong praise. But um, you have a true gift at explaining very, very abstract concepts uh, like CP violation, uh, things in my audience, because they're the brilliant, most brilliant audience in the known universe, uh, have uh, seen and encountered and, and even had great, great uh, conversations about. I want to talk about uh, these departures from, you know, again, anomalies that don't seem to make sense. And here's a line of logic that I've been using, and maybe you can disabuse me of it. Uh, but the fact that the uh, laws of nature aren't perfectly symmetric. Um, and in a certain sense, we're trying to enforce things like supersymmetry uh, and, and so forth, which has to date not really panned out according to the rubric you outlined, uh, you know, two or three questions ago, we should apply Bayes' rule. And so I wonder, is it a fool's errand to try to uh, impose kind of this need for beauty, symmetry, parsimony, economy on the laws of nature when we know that they're actually in violation of it on a regular basis. And in fact, you know, if I had a bet on it, I might not even suspect that Lorentz 
invariance holds over the entirety of the universe. So what do you make of this desire to, to, I mean, if an alien knew the answer and was looking at our theories and say, why are you looking for something so symmetric? We know the universe isn't symmetric. And so why are you trying to cram all these theories into one, you know, God equation, which we'll get to in a bit. Do you think that that's a fool's errand? Do you think that's a, a, a more of a projection of, of physicists as, as human beings rather than as, you know, purely scientific entities? Or do you think there's something to be gained for looking for symmetry, beauty, and parsimony? Well, uh, that's uh, that's a very important question, uh, uh, and it's certainly true uh, that over the past uh, two or three hundred years, uh, the, uh, the application of Occam's razor has really manifested itself by uh, uh, looking for symmetries, uh, just as uh, sometimes as simplifying features in an uh, in an approximation, uh, and uh, there's always this danger that something that seems to work so well in so many ways, we will take uh, a sort of founding principle of the nature of reality. Um, but it's clear that if the, the universe was symmetric in all its aspects, that, that we wouldn't be here, that you have to break symmetries to get structure. Uh, and um, the one that, of course, most intrigued me, because it goes right back to my PhD th thesis, was the time reversal symmetry uh, breaking. Uh, and it's, it's, again, a case of, well, who needs that? Yeah. Um, we, we can uh, break the symmetry of the world by setting the universe up in uh, an orderly state and letting the second law of thermodynamics do the rest. We, you know, why do we need to break uh, a T-violation down at the particle physics level? And nobody's really ever connected those two up. Nobody has ever said, well, a T-violation in particle physics explains the ordered nature of the universe just after the Big Bang. Some, some people have dabbled around in that. But uh, it, so it remains one of these sort of oddities. So why is it there? And it could just be, again, that we've had a dream run of success. Um, the, we're in a similar situation, I think, with linearity. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the great advances in physics in the 19th century stemmed in large part from the fact that many everyday phenomena are approximately linear, and you can go a long way uh, using uh, linear differential equations and uh, um, free air analysis, those sorts of things. Uh, and so that works well for, you know, heat conduction and, uh, and wave motion and uh, you know, a whole bunch of things that are important. But uh, in the last uh, 50 years or so, uh, the importance of nonlinear phenomena have become very uh, prominent and in particular chaos theory and uh, various forms of complexity, which have become popular but difficult to study because they're not tractable by these simple scientific uh, methods, simple equations. Um, and so that raises the interesting question, have we just cherry-picked the stuff that mm. we're good at? Mm -hmm. uh, and that we say, physics is amazing, explained all these things, look, um, uh, we, we know the secret to the universe and we've got all these equations. Um, but we're just defining success in terms of this uh, rather small subset of phenomena. Uh, we're surrounded by all sorts of things we really don't understand, you know, including things like turbulence, uh, which um, uh, it, it so boils down to is it a bottle half full or half, <laughs> half empty? And just quite how much longer we can uh, have success with essentially 19th century methods is an interesting thought. You know, mm. are, we, are we getting to the point where we simply can't do that? I don't, uh, I mentioned that I've become sort of obsessed with uh, life and the physics of living matter and so on. I don't think traditional laws of physics, uh, linear or otherwise, are a good fit to the nature of life. Um, the, 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 to understand life, we need to organize data about the world in a completely different way from uh, underlying laws and initial and boundary conditions. So to, you can try doing that, but you don't get very far. So there must be another way of doing science, uh, which, um, which we need to come up with. Some people think this is also true in cosmology, that because it, if you think there's only one universe, and that we can argue about that, mm -hmm. uh, but if there is only one, what does it mean to say we apply the laws of physics to the universe? Because if there's only one of it, the whole idea of, of laws is that there's supposed to be um, a, a, a whole class of uh, similar systems and you can have different initial conditions and so on. Uh, if there's only one universe, uh, can we meaningfully apply laws to it uh, or do, does it need some other way of, uh, of, of attack? So, um, you know, I think we might be approaching the point where we need some radically new thinking, not just about the particular equations that we 
use, but the, at a deeper level, the way we organize our facts about the world, uh, maybe after three or 400 years, uh, we, we need a different way of thinking about it. Yeah, I wanted to move into that subject, perhaps, and that'll lead us into a, a discussion of the laws of uh, of nature in a universe uh, that is a set of elements within the multiverse. And you talk a lot in the book about, you know, historical approach to our understanding of the cosmos and, and even uh, and even the great, you know, debates of, of previous centuries and even of this current century. And I would say that, you know, one of the most uh, prominent among them is, of course, the existence of the multiverse and the concomitant conjecture of a string landscape, perhaps. Um, these are fascinating. These are uh, very uh, delightful to consider and to contemplate uh, until you start to think, you know, are people taking this really seriously? And uh, you, of course, uh, have a very famous uh, article that was in the New York Times, and we'll talk about that when we talk about uh, God, but, uh, but, but specifically uh, relating to the multiverse, which is a, an allied outcome of most theories of inflation, in other words, the the theory of uh, uh, that the ex that there must be an infinity or at least a very large number of universes, uh, as you say, in order to explain the uh, scientific the uh, uns the properties of the features of the universe we do see is just as ad hoc as invoking an unseen creator. The multiverse theory may be dressed up in scientific language, but in essence, it requires the same leap of faith. Um, and so, I want to get into that. Um, um, the statement about faith and, and God and so forth. But first, I want to take a step back. On a personal level, um, you made fundamental contributions to the theory of inflation, which now comes with this, you know, ad hoc uh, edition of the multiverse. Um, first, can you explain uh, this foundational discovery that you and um, and Bunch, I forget what Bunch's name, first name is, but you Tim, can tell me. Timothy Bunch. Timothy Bunch. Um, the Bunch Davies vacuum state. What is that? How did you come upon it, and what does it have to do with inflation? Right. Uh, so I, I touched on this a little bit earlier um, in two ways. Uh, uh, one is that uh, we wanted uh, in the uh, late 1970s to try to understand the quantum vacuum uh, in the presence of a gravitational field. And Leonard Parker had blazed the trail by looking at particle creation and expanding universes. But there were a lot of uh, unclear aspects at that time. We didn't quite know how to think about a lot of these things. And the mathematical techniques uh, to regularize, as we say, the stress, energy, and momentum tensor hadn't really been worked out. Uh, a lot of people were working on that, and, and that got hammered out in the 1970s. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, that um, for young people, it's great for them to uh, have uh, dreamy thoughts about uh, big <laughs> questions, but they also have to have some solid accomplishments. And the one burden uh, upon a anybody who has a student uh, is you've got to give them something uh, that is not only interesting, but that, that they can work out. Uh, and, and so Tim needed his PhD. We needed uh, to uh, find a, a system, a, a type of universe and a type of quantum field where the equations can be solved and Tim would uh, get his degree. Um, and uh, the, what appealed to us uh, was uh, De Sitter space. Now, let me just say, De Sitter space is a space that uh, doubles in size in a fixed time. So it's exponentially expanding. It was suggested by Willem De Sitter in, I think, 1917, you know, pretty early on, just after Einstein's general theory of relativity. Um, and it was a sort of toy model. Um, the extraordinary thing about De Sitter space is it's got the same number of symmetries, here we go again, as ordinary Minkowski space, flat space time. Uh, and so the equations of uh, quantum physics uh, are just as easy to solve in De Sitter space as they would be in, in, you know, in the lab. Um, uh, having said they're just as easy to solve, the solutions uh, are less familiar functions. But the, the technique for solving it is uh, just as easy. So um, Tim uh, worked uh, through all of that and uh, duly got his uh, PhD. Uh, and uh, we didn't know at that time that uh, De Sitter space would play such a prominent role. Uh, we, it, it seemed uh, pretty clear from the astronomical evidence that we weren't living in De Sitter space. It looked like the universe was decelerating. Mm. Uh, and so two things then happened over some decades. The first is 
that inflation came along. And inflation means a phase of exponential expansion, extremely rapid, in the first split second of the universe. And that was posited by Andre Linde, Alex Vilenkin, and others in the early 1980s as a way of explaining why the universe looks, uh, as I said early, like the, you know, the, the perfect baby, uh, so smooth and unblemished and uh, uniform. Uh, that nicely explains it. And so it was an attempt to get, get around that mystery. Um, but of course, it was precisely this exponential expansion that we had worked on and we had these equations ready for. And uh, if you believe, uh, because the, uh, the E folding time for this exponential expansion is, uh, is stupendously small, 10 to the minus 34 seconds or something, quantum effects are going to be all important. And so here we, here we are with quantum effects in an expanding universe. When inflation came to an end, uh, because it you know, has, has ended uh, and uh, morphed into a traditional decelerating slow expansion. When that happened, uh, the quantum fluctuations during that inflationary phase got sort of frozen in and writ large and written in the sky, imprinted in the pattern in the background, the cosmic microwave background radiation. It's sort of up there for everyone to see. Uh, there, if you believe this, those are quantum fluctuations uh, in the sky, but it's a snapshot of them. They're not fluctuating anymore. Uh, and um, so that, that's really how that came to exist. Then the other, the other thing that happened, of course, uh, is that in the late 1990s, astronomers discovered that maybe the universe isn't decelerating after all, but it's actually the expansion rate speeding up and that we're now embarking on another phase of exponential expansion, but now with a, uh, an e-folding time of you know, billions of years and not uh, a tiny fraction of a second. Uh, so suddenly, you know, De Sitter space, which was a curiosity in the 70s, turns out to have at least two applications to modern physics. So that, that's how I came to be involved. And nowadays we hear a lot, or at least we did up until 2018, when sadly your friend and colleague uh, Stephen Hawking passed away, we heard a lot about these bets uh, involving black holes and information. And you talk a little bit about the information paradox. I, I always uh, don't like to reveal all the contents of the book because I want everybody to buy a copy of it in both uh, hard copy and in a digital media formats as I have. Uh, but I want to uh, go back to that because as I understand it, uh, Stephen would concede all these bets. And as uh, as Sir Roger Penrose said once to me, you know, the good thing about bet making a bet with Stephen is that uh, you could you could always be on his side, no matter which side you chose. <laughs> um, uh, but Stephen would concede these bets, for example, by conjecturing, as Juan Maldacena has done, that you could uh, solve the black hole uh, information loss paradox and you could do so. But you could only do so in anti disitter space. Uh, as far as I know, uh, we don't live in anti sitter space. So wh why do why did he concede these bets on the basis of something that not only is falsifiable, but was false is falsified? Why would you think that he would concede such things? Was it merely for attention? I hope not. But um, how, how do you reconcile this fascination with all these things like, you know, extra dimensions and so forth and, and anti sitter space when we have zero evidence and maybe contradictory evidence to those claims? Well, first of all, um, you know, Stephen and the bet. So he was very fond of doing U-turns, and, uh, and I loved him for it. Um, the, the, the one that I was most involved in myself is uh, when, uh, uh, for a time, he thought that if the universe recontracts, the arrow of time would be reversed. And seeing as I'd uh, uh, written a PhD thesis on that, I thought, oh, not that again. <laughs> uh, because uh, uh, sometimes uh, this idea that we, we live in a cyclic universe, a uh, cycle in time, a groundhog day type universe, uh, it's, it's referred to in, uh, by anthropologists as the myth of the eternal return. And, and so I was fond of saying, oh, the eternal return has made another return. Um, and I, I, the number of scientists who who got caught up on this. So the first I knew was Tommy Gold, mm -hmm. uh, and then John Wheeler, uh, who would uh, sometimes talk about the turning of the tide, a uh, wonderful metaphor, uh, typical Wheeler. Um, and uh, uh, then, uh, you know, along came Stephen, saying uh, that this might uh, be the case. Uh, and then uh, Murray Gellman and Jim Hartle. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is an idea that won't go away. Right. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I have... Um, 
not just theoretical reasons for objecting to it. I think um, there are observational uh, reasons why we shouldn't take it too seriously. But in that, that particular case, Stephen uh, did retract. I was there uh, at the retraction. It was in uh, Spain, a conference there, and uh, he gave a lecture entitled uh, My Greatest Mistake, um, echoing Einstein, uh, whose uh, uh, <laughs> rejection of the, co of the cosmological whose acceptance of the cosmological constant was his greatest mistake. And so, so Stephen uh, flipped around on that. I'm not sure that any bet, I didn't take the bet. Uh, <laughs> you know, I did, didn't think to place a bet uh, on that one. Um, but the black, coming to the black hole uh, case, and that uh, um, uh, uh, was a long-standing bet. And, and it was always a mystery, you see, uh, way back in the 70s, that, OK, black holes glow with heat. Um, how does the energy get out of the black hole because uh, nothing's supposed to come out of a, of a black hole. That seemed a bit strange. And that's something I've already alluded to, that my colleagues and, and I, and I must thank uh, um, Larry Ford and uh, Stephen Frilling and Bill Unruh uh, and, uh, and, and others uh, who uh, helped work out the stress, energy, momentum tense around a black hole. And we, we showed that the, uh, what happens is you have a flux of negative energy flowing into the black hole, not positive energy coming out. Uh, and uh, there's negative energy around all the time. What it means is uh, that if you take the energy of the quantum vacuum in just sort of ordinary vacuum in, a, in, uh, in the lab or something like that, if you can contrive a state of affairs where the energy is less than that, uh, then we would call that negative energy. Now, and a very well-known example is the Casimir effect. You have a couple of mirrors facing each other, and the uh, energy of the vacuum between those mirrors is a little bit less than what it would be if the mirrors weren't there. So that idea is not so bad. Um, gravity can produce uh, negative energies. So the gravity of the Earth produces a cloud of negative energy around it. It's, it's tiny. Um, but around a black hole, it's really quite big. And Paul, is it is it semantic in that you know we if we called it positive, we'd be asking why is there positive energy flowing into a black hole, or is it you know Ben Franklin you know called the charge carrier and it was a negative charge carrier and and uh, the electron um, and and that comp is it is it semantic or is there something truly you know fundamental about the aspect of it being negative as opposed to positive? Right, there is. So when we were in high school, we were told, well, the zero of energy is arbitrary and uh, it's energy differences only that you can measure. And that's true until you come to gravitation. Uh, and if what you say is, well, energy gravitates, then that's uh, a physical effect. And you can say, will this particular state uh, exert a gravity, bend space time, basically. Mm -hmm. So if you define flat space time to not be not bent, then that uh, the quantum vacuum in flat space time has got to be defined as zero energy. I think that's a, a very reasonable thing. So anything that is less than that, we would call negative energy. And you can uh, gravitational fields can uh, make it negative or positive. So it has uh, both of those effects. So around a black hole, it's negative. It flows in, and it pays for the Hawking radiation. And so that was a fairly uh, simple one. Uh, but then there was this uh, this other one. Uh, well, you know, what happens to the information that falls down a black hole, or the stuff that falls in, the, if you have a star, or if you have a black hole there and you throw in the famous example, throw in some encyclopedias, you know, what happens to all that information? Uh, where the, the feeling was in the 70s, it's swallowed up forever, it's never going to come back, uh, and that information is simply lost. Uh, down the black hole. That didn't seem so shocking because Hawking and Penrose and others uh, told us that there were singularities inside the black hole, and a singularity is a, an edge of space time, boundary. Uh, so if information hit that boundary, it would cease to exist, at least in our space time. Gone. That's it. Uh, it didn't seem so shocking. But this didn't sit well with people from a particle physics uh, background and uh, now a string theory background, that they don't like the idea uh, of. Um, gravitation, uh, space-time structure calling the shots. They want quantum mechanics to call the shots. They want that to be the founding set of principles that govern the universe. And uh, quantum mechanics uh, is a simple theorem uh, that uh, information uh, can't be created or destroyed, uh, defined in a certain way. Um, and uh, you know what were we going to do about that? Well, um, a lot of people at the time thought, and I think they still do, that uh, black holes simply violate that uh, quantum principle. Uh, 
but um, Stephen, uh, towards the end of his career, decided to do one of his U-turns, uh, and having said, well, it was violated, then said, well, maybe there is a way for it to get out. But the problem here <laughs> is that uh, when you, you look at this as a technical challenge, you want to solve um, the back reaction of uh, a quantum field on a black hole and see how it shrinks and what happens, what its end state might be. Um, well, the simple answer is we don't have a good theory of quantum gravitation that can handle that very dense final state. Will it be singular? Will it be something else? What will happen to it when the black hole evaporates? We don't know how to do those calculations. But we do know from the work of Don Page uh, that you hit a problem uh, long before the black hole shrinks down to a Planck size or something like that. Um, you, you hit a problem about uh, the, the head count of all the bits of information. Mm. Uh, and so uh, there is something we don't fully understand. And the mathematical models that people have appealed to, to say, well, the information gets out by this or that mechanism, are all extremely idealized and, and totally unrealistic cases, uh, which, um, w which have got a great deal of appeal because people can manipulate the equations. I think this is still uh, one of the, the great unsolved problems mm. of theoretical physics. And it's one of the things I allude to in the book as uh, we need the next generation of of young people to, mm -hmm. to, to tackle that one. Uh -huh. And uh, if we also look at the concomitant, you know, realization or most wonderful realization of his life, according to Albert Einstein, was that uh, a freely falling observer would experience no gravitational field. Um, the corollary that you and Bill Unruh and, and maybe it was Paige, I, I forget who, came up with was that uh, you could actually detect acceleration in the universe via an equivalent to the Hawking radiation effect. I wonder if we can talk a little bit about that. Um, I've developed a great interest nowadays in thinking about um, the possibility that perhaps the universe doesn't respect Lorentz invariance and why that shouldn't be thought of as so sacrosanct uh, without some uh, further degree of evidence. It's, it's a nice shortcut, a hack, a tr you know, and it certainly seems to hold locally. But as we know, things that hold locally don't often hold globally. Uh, so as Einstein, you know, called this uh, the happiest thought of his life. And I, by the way, I think that that is a reason that we should never fear artificially intelligent physicists, because I don't know, first of all, if an artificial intelligence could experience happiness uh, and therefore come up with the, the strong equivalence print or the weak equivalence principle. But I also don't know if it uh, could experience, uh, you know, what free fall really would mean, because it's sort of a visceral sensation attached to a body. So uh, I could probably debate that with Noam Chomsky again. But I want to ask you. Um, it's it's sort of taken for granted that uh, that motion is relative since the time of Galileo and the first relativistic uh, you know discovery that you talk about in eating the universe what's eating the universe, uh, but that acceleration could be absolute. Can you explain and walk us through that logic? How can velocity be strictly uh, you know uh, the strictly not not uh, strictly relative, but acceleration could be absolute. How could those two go? After all, isn't one just a time derivative of the other? Well, I touched on this a little bit earlier when I talked about Mach's principle. And so yeah. this really goes right back to the, uh, the founding fathers of modern physics, uh, Galileo, Newton, Leibniz, Descartes, and, and others about the nature of motion. And I, I think uh, everybody came to accept that uh, uh, linear motion or unaccelerated motion is purely relative. That uh, there's, you can't sit in empty space and measure your speed relative to space itself. Um, but uh, um, acceleration seems quite different because you feel it. Uh, and the, the example I give in the book, you're flying uh, at some altitude uh, at a steady rate and you fall asleep, uh, uh, as I often do on takeoff. You can't, <laughs> can't tell if you're static on the ground or whether you're actually 500 miles an hour in the air. I do that um, too, but I'm a pilot, so it's a little more dangerous. Ah, right, right. No, don't fall asleep then. Um, but, um, uh, but, you know, if you hit turbulence, you know, immediately mm. uh, uh, you can feel it. And so uh, for Newton... Uh, something like rotation, uh, he regarded as absolute. The Earth bulges at the equator, and he uh, felt that that would be true even in an empty universe. Um, but there's a long uh, alternative tradition which says no, even rotation and acceleration more generally has to be gauged against the, the distant matter in the universe. After all, 
the world goes round, it bulges at the equator, and we look up at the sky, and the stars are going round. And so we can tell the Earth is spinning by looking at the stars, but we can also tell it's spinning by measuring how wide it is around the waist. Um, and so uh, these are obviously connected through Newton's equations. But this idea uh, that maybe even accelerated motion is relative to distant matter in the universe uh, g continues. And it went, uh, well, Ernst Mach uh, g gave us the uh, famous Mach numbers, um, uh, believed that there was a way of somehow incorporating the local uh, the technical term is compass of inertia, but I mean basically these forces, uh, like centrifugal force, uh, could be attributed to the distant matter in the universe. And I mentioned about my work in my PhD, the Wheeler-Feynman theory of electrodynamics, which has, um, uh, t it's a time symmetric thing where radiation goes out into the universe, but advanced radiation comes back at you, and you're coupling what's happening in the radio station to what's happening in the distant matter. Mach's principle is a similar sort of thing. Uh, if you can make it work, it's a way of connecting local physics to the, to the stars, you know, to put it romantically. Um, the <laughs> trouble is nobody's really been able to make it work terribly well. Einstein was a great fan of it, hoped it would be there in his general theory of relativity, but it's not. Uh, mm -hmm. There's something called the Kerr solution mm -hmm. of uh, rotating black holes, uh, and it's uh, uh, empty space outside of, uh, of this uh, black hole, and so there's no other matter, and yet the Kerr solution uh, has... Uh, if you put a test particle in, you can, it does, you can measure the rotation of this uh, spinning black hole. So this is unfinished business, but mm -hmm. I don't know if you want me to connect it to the story of accelerating. I, I would, I would. I would like to know how could we actually measure our absolute acceleration using the effect that you and colleagues discovered? Well, well, you see, the, the, uh, we were all brought up on this idea that gravitation and uh, acceleration were the same. Um, uh, which is, of course, as you say, debatable, but it, I didn't need to think too much about it. So when Stephen Hawking uh, announced his uh, black hole result, and I thought, how can that be? I'm a bit skeptical. Can I uh, think, and I don't, wasn't sure I understood the calculation, um, that uh, can I think of a simpler example? Uh, then I thought, well, you know, what about uniform acceleration? And I was already familiar with Rindler's uh, textbook, on uniformly accelerating observers, and you have a horizon there, just like it's a black hole horizon. And I knew of the work of Stephen Fulling, who then became a close colleague of mine, uh, in which he looked at quantum fields in, a, mm. in uh, the Rindler coordinate system. Uh, and I thought, well, I just need some sort of simple argument that uh, ties all this together that would suggest that an accelerating observer would basically see Hawking radiation in the same way. Um, and, uh, and I produced and and published that, I didn't think uh, anybody would pay too much attention. And, and a funny little postscript, and here's a lesson for students. Um, I also thought I knew, of course, from, uh, from simple enough uh, physics, that De Sitter space uh, would be a, have a similar uh, coordinate system, and there would be a temperature of De Sitter space. And I remember sitting there. In mm. those days, I didn't even have an office, didn't have a desk. I was sitting at my wife's dressing table. And I, I thought, well, yes, OK, so I can work out the temperature to sit in space. What is it? Well, what do I put in for the rate of, for the Hubble constant? And I put in, uh, you know, the currently measured value. And out came the temperature of, I don't know, 10 to the minus 30 degrees or something. I thought, well, no one would be interested in that. I won't bother to mention it. <laughs> so I wrote the paper and left out the sitter space bit. And, uh, and then the, the next year, Bill Unruh uh, wrote, uh, sort of discovered the same effect uh, by a different argument involving a, a model of a, a somewhat cumbersome model in those days of, a, of an accelerated detector that would go click, click, click. Uh, and then Bryce DeWitt did a very nice uh, job uh, producing a you know, more usable model of an accelerating detector. Um, and you know, the rest is history, as they say. This turned out to be, uh, uh, it, it's still unclear to me whether anybody has experimentally uh, verified this uh, acceleration effect. Um, from time to time, I get papers and claims that this is sort of done either directly or indirectly. The, the numbers are very small. You need a very, very high acceleration uh, to have a detectable, you know, one degree or something. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, uh, but I think we're sort of, we're beginning to see hints, hints of it anyway. 
so that, that's how I came into it. Um, looking, looking back on it, it didn't seem any big deal at the time. <laughs> uh, but, but some people think it's important. Dennis Shiama, I might say, who was the uh, PhD thesis advisor of Hawking and, and Penrose, Penrose yeah. and, uh, and many other, uh, very, um, uh, Martin Reitz as well. Yeah. Um, uh, he, uh, he was very fond of this, um, and he thought uh, this was, was very significant, that this acceleration effect uh, really uh, told us something very deep about the nature of the universe. Um, mm. and, uh, and I think that dream lives on, but you know, we're several decades on from this work in the yeah. 70s, and uh, not sure how much more progress we've made. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's somewhat uh, delightful in some ways, but I think these things really elicit the, uh, the biggest picture questions that human beings might be capable of answering or asking at least, maybe not answering, but at least uh, asking them. And I wanted to segue that into uh, a talk about God, if you will indulge me with some forbearance. Yeah, uh, you, you and I have talked in person when I visited you and, and colleagues at Arizona State University, <clears throat> uh, where you have been uh, for many years and continue to contribute in public fora and in uh, and in research and, and education as well in such a such a monumental fashion. But we we chatted a, on a walk about this notion of of life as sort of information, and I wonder if you know you are familiar with this famous monograph by Schrodinger, "What Is Life?" And you know he comes up with some ideas, and he even mentions you know, molecular basis that, you know, was wrong. It was a crystal that was aperiodic, not a double helix of nucleotides. But uh, I wonder if you could recapitulate a little bit of your thoughts on on life as information, which which I believe you touched upon in, in a previous book. Um, but uh, what what is life uh, to answer uh, the, uh, if you can answer Schrodinger's question left unanswered in his book? Well, uh, we've gone from God to life, so let's... Uh, we'll you know, go back to God, don't God, worry. <laughs> God's a big one. Uh, but, but the life, yes. So I read that book when I was a student, and I thought, mm, yeah, it does seem... Uh, life does seem pretty remarkable to a physicist. Uh, I think I said earlier, it's like magic. Um, uh, but, uh, what, you know, what do we need? Now, his aperiodic crystal uh, actually turned out to be very prescient, because mm. although he didn't say, well, it's a double hel helical structure, um, he was exactly right that uh, what a life needs uh, what uh, genetic information needs. It needs some stability if it's to be handed on from one generation to the next. It shouldn't be thermally disrupted. Mm. So it needs to be have the property, st stable property of a crystal. It needs to lock in um, its structure. Mm -hmm. uh, but it needs, uh, crystals uh, don't contain any information. They're just periodic structures. Um, and so what you need to encode information is to have uh, to break the symmetry, as we were talking about earlier, and you have um, ir irregularities of some sort. Mm -hmm. and, he, and so the idea of an aperiodic uh, crystal is exactly, it's, it's an information-rich, stable molecule. It's just what DNA is. And because of the four-letter alphabet of DNA, uh, you can encode a staggering amount of information. Uh, in, a, in a strand of DNA, but it is, it is relatively stable. It's not disrupted by thermal uh, fluctuations uh, at room temperature. So that, that was uh, uh, pretty mm. good. But I don't think he answered the question. I think he hoped that somehow quantum mechanics would come to the rescue. Um, after all, quantum mechanics explains all other matter, but it sort of curiously can't explain living matter. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, rather more adventurously, and I take this as the jumping off point for my own recent interests, he said mm -hmm. that we must be prepared to find a new kind of physical law prevailing in it, by it he meant living systems. Mm -hmm. uh, not just a new physical law, not just, uh, you know, alongside Maxwell's equations and so forth, we, we've got, you know, Schrodinger's life equation, a new kind of physical law. And as I said earlier, I think that traditional laws of physics are not a good fit in biology for reasons mm -hmm. we could talk about at length, but, but one of them has to do with the uh, the separation of, uh, of scales uh, by which we make so much progress in, uh, in most areas of physics. Take solar physics, for example. Uh, we can talk about uh, turbulence in the, um, in the photosphere without worrying about the nuclear reactions taking place in the, in the core and so forth. So we can sort of separate the scales out very well. With life, you can't do that. There's top up and uh, top down and bottom up causation, and it's all a tangled, sort of self-consistent uh, mess. But to to actually directly answer your question, what is life? I would say it's a sort of catchphrase, but that a lot of people use that life is chemistry plus information. 
Mm. The essential thing about life is that the information is not just any old um, uh, mishmash of, of, uh, of bits. It's, uh, it's actually, I can say that again, it's not any mishmash of bits. Uh, it's actually information which is uh, organized and which can bring about uh, the or organization of, of matter. In other words, it mm. serves a management role. Uh, and so uh, we, if you measure information in bits, as Shannon taught us uh, many decades ago, it doesn't somehow capture uh, the contextual nature of biological information. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, it, for example, if we've been talking about DNA, um, take a gene. Uh, what is a gene? Well, it's um, a gene is uh, a set of instructions for a ribosome to make a protein, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you can't tell by looking at a particular sequence of DNA whether it's instructional information or just junk. Mm -hmm. You just shuffled the bits. <laughs> you couldn't tell. It's only in the context of the system as a whole that you can tell that that information is instructional, uh, that it is functional. And so uh, we can't... You see, this is what I say earlier, the, the, the scales. You can't decompose it in the same way that we like to in physics, it's a yes. systemic property. So we need information which is um, uh, which is potent only in the context of the system as a whole. And there has to be a molecular milieu that can interpret those instructions and act on it. So we're into this sort of dodgy area like you know semantic information and meaning and so on. That that the. Uh, Instructions in DNA have to mean something to the organism, and, <laughs> and philosophers jump on you to say, well, you can't use terms like meaning, and so you sort of slide around with the terminology. But there's no getting away from it that we're dealing uh, in living systems with not just Shannon bits, but with uh, something that goes beyond that, that we have not yet properly captured, I don't think. Yeah. And of course, that does evoke uh, concepts of creation and the ultimate teleological entity uh, and all uh, knowing omnipresent, uh, omniscient, omnipotent creator. And I do want to pivot there to uh, to uh, questions of theology. You've been on Unbelievable and, and you've had debates with uh, with uh, with um, the believers and, and non-believers. I want to ask you, because it's not exactly clear, it's sort of uh, a little bit ambiguous or has been to me. Where, where do you come down? I mean, is that a proper question? First of all, I, I've I've heard people like, you know, Jordan Peterson and, and others say things like, you know, how can you say believe in God? You know, and it's better to say, does God believe in me? Is that even a meaningful question? First of all, to, for me to even ask you. Uh, well, I've, I'm asked that all the time. And my uh, answer is, well, I'm not a conventionally religious person. Uh, that's number one. And number two is that as a scientist, I don't have to uh, uh, say, well, this is the way it is, and uh, I'm not going to change my mind. And so I'm interested in the issues and the concepts mm -hmm. um, that you can't work in areas like cosmology, where you ask questions like what happened before the Big Bang, uh, what is the nature of time, and then you go to quantum physics, what's the nature of reality, and uh, then you go to life, what is life, and then what is consciousness, you know, all those things which I love to think about. You can't think about those without coming up against those same age-old questions that for centuries were part of religion. Mm -hmm. And so I naturally find myself talking to those people. They seem interested in what I have to say. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, my advice is always this, for, for anyone uh, listening to these words, um, that uh, in my view, it's uh, perfectly okay to uh, be a scientist and think, well, what, what does my scientific work suggest about and I've got to use the dreaded M word again, meaning or mm. purpose in the universe, if anything. You know, does it suggest there is or there isn't? Um, uh, that you, you can arrive at a conclusion, well, there's something going on, or as I prefer to say, there is a, uh, a rational scheme of things uh, that science is uh, busy uh, unraveling, that, uh, that the universe is, uh, um, is not just a uh, hodgepodge of odds and ends. It is uh, a coherent uh, scheme that we can come to understand, and I think that's deeply significant. So you, you, through your science, you can arrive at a position, and if that happens to concur with some particular religious point of view, well, then that's uh, of some interest. But what you absolutely don't do is decide in advance what you want to believe. I think there's a God that did this and that, and shoehorn the scientific facts to fit. And I'm afraid there's far too many people in that latter category. They've already made up their minds that they believe in a particular type of God, and... Uh, 
Uh, the worst example is, of course, um, the so-called God of the gaps. So if, uh, if somebody is convinced uh, that there is a God and God uh, created life, um, and they'll turn around and they'll say, well, you scientists can't explain the origin of life, so therefore we need God. I mean, that's, that's an appalling line of reasoning. So, um, first of all, I haven't really got a fixed position on these things. Secondly, I'm not conventionally religious. I don't uh, go to church or anything of that sort. Um, and, uh, uh, but I, you know, I like to talk to theologians. Some of them are very smart. You see, some, some if you think uh, back like 500 years, the greatest intellectuals were actually, you know, theologians and mathematicians. Uh, and these people uh, de de dealt with these really tough topics, like if there is a God, is God within time or outside of time? And can something come from nothing? And, you know, why does mathematics work? And, how, you know, they've thought very carefully about those things. Um, and I have found, uh, found that, uh, you know, entertaining and sometimes productive to revisit some of those mm. old arguments. I'm particularly interested in one that theologians don't want to talk about anymore, um, uh, which is uh, the concept of a necessary being. You know, we're, uh, we're all engaged in trying to explain the universe, and then religious people say, well, it all goes down to God, and then you say, well, how do you explain God? Well, God doesn't need an explanation. Well, that's no good. But then they turn it around and say, well, what do you think? And I think, well, the laws of physics seem to do a nice job. Well, where do they come from? Mm -hmm. uh, what's the origin of those? And I say, oh, well, most scientists don't like asking that question. They, they just sort of accept it as given. And they say, well, point made. You know, we, we both have a, what I sometimes call a levitating super turtle that holds the Tower of Turtles up. And the question is, whether you call it God, laws of physics, or something else we haven't invented yet, um, is it the case that we could... Uh, that we could be sure of something absolutely, that there is something uh, that would form the bedrock on which the rest of our explanatory scheme would rest. And the concept of a necessary being uh, came out of uh, monotheism as a notion that God's non-existence would be logically impossible. That, that is, a necessary being is a being uh, that, that cannot not exist. Um, and is it possible to make that argument? And uh, people tried to do that, and as I say, very few theologians these days will want to dabble around in that. They'd regard it as a, you know, not not a pro proper, right. proper subject for theology. But I think it's you know really important whether it's science or theology or any ultimate explanations. Is it going to be an infinite regress, an infinite tower of turtles, or can we mm -hmm. somehow uh, come up with a, a conceptual scheme that gives us great confidence for that we can build upon? Now, this necessary being, if such a thing is coherent concept, is, does, doesn't necessarily bear any relation at all to traditional gods. And, and I don't really have uh, very much time for traditional notions of deities. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't appeal to me very much. But I do think um, the way I prefer to put it is that, uh, that the existence of a universe that uh, complex self-complexifies, that brings forth uh, life and brings forth beings like ourselves who can not only observe the universe but comprehend it in some deep mathematical sense, uh, I think is uh, tremendously significant. And so I think we are, there is a scheme of things, and we humble human beings are not the pinnacle of creation or anything, but we're embedded in this scheme of things in a, in a manner that our science uh, ma manifests that embedding. It's through for me, through science and mathematics, that I feel I'm part of this, this bigger scheme. It's a long way from traditional religion, but then I think we need to get away from traditional religion. We need to go beyond traditional religion. It's fine if it gives people comfort and fulfills a social function, but as an explanation for the physical world, uh, it's well past its use by date. So, so that's really my position. Mm -hmm. I'm expressing it uh, pretty bluntly, but uh, that's the way I feel. No, I think that's wonderful. And actually that you are willing to grapple with it is in concert with the greatest, you know, minds of, of history, including, you know, uh, Paul Dirac and Stephen Hawking, both of whose gravestones you show rather macabre in this Halloween season, you show both of their tombstones. Yeah, I was, I was waiting for Boltzmann's tombstone to make an appearance, but uh, Dirac of course said, God is a mathematician of a very high order. And he used advanced mathematics in constructing the universe. Albert Einstein once Mark, what interests me is whether God had any choice in the creation of the world. And Stephen Hawking said, if we do discover a theory of everything, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason. For then we would truly know the mind of God, the God equation, 
Um, of course, at least one of those, you know, is essentially a, a militant or at least a self-declared atheist, Stephen Hawking, uh, of course, as ambiguous uh, whether or not Albert Einstein and, and Paul Dirac were actually, uh, you know, the theologically inclined. Um, but this brings us to the final topic, which has to do before we get into my patented existential questions, uh, which I will remind folks that you need to subscribe to my to my mailing list to get the answers to Paul's uh, responses to my thrilling three existential questions that I'll be asking in just a minute. But before we get there, I want to ask if your thoughts on the multiverse have evolved. And you famously said, um, invoking an infinity of unseen universes, in other words, the multiverse, to explain the unusual features of the one we do see is just as ad hoc as invoking an unseen creator. The multiverse theory may be dressed up in scientific language, but in essence, it requires the same leap of faith. And I use that in a Prager University video that I shared with you once. Um, but I want to ask you, are those, you know, Hawking and and uh, clearly was in, not in, literally in, in taking seriously the notion of God's existence and the mind of God. Uh, it's ambiguous. Again, uh, Leonard Mladenow was on the podcast uh, last year and said, you know, that was basically to not turn off, you know, 90 percent of the possible readership uh, who do believe in God and his ex-wife, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Einstein, as I said, was, you know, said as many kind of atheistic uh, allied statements as as pro-theistic statements, if you will. And Dirac, as I said, never once really mentioned it besides God in that one sentence about mathematics. Um, are you using creator here? Are you using God here and the notion of God as a uh, as sort of a bromide or, or to chastise the kind of uh, approach of, of modern physicists, including your former colleague there, Lawrence Krauss, who was on the show not too long ago, um, you know, that they invoke this multiverse um, and it's tantamount to God without you obviously believing and ascribing in a specific instantiation of God. In other words, is this more of a, of a commentary on, on physicists' willingness um, to uh, you know, accept potentially unfalsifiable notions, or is it uh, something else? And have your feelings evolved since that article in The Times a uh, couple of uh, maybe 10 years ago? Uh, I don't think my feelings have evolved. Uh, I do believe that to be a scientist, you have to have, uh, accept as an act of faith, I mean, you've got to believe that the universe is ordered in a rational manner. And that furthermore, it's intelligible, at least in part to us, because it would be a fruitless exercise. It was all too baffling. You wouldn't bother to do it. Um, and so uh, th 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 that's the sort of founding um, faith that uh, you, you, you need to, to start doing science. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, uh, is that somehow, uh, you know, ju just as bad, if you like, or just as, as much a leap of faith as people who say, well, I believe in a rational God who created it all. Um, and I, of course, I'm, as I indicated earlier, I'm interested in those sorts of concepts. And and as a matter of fact, I have come up with a research project that if anyone listening uh, to this uh, is interested in doing this, uh, then uh, th there may even be a source of funding. And it's the following. The people bandy these words around uh, like um, my, uh, my Tower of Turtles is better than your Tower of Turtles because it's simpler, that sort of thing. Uh, and there's a famous argument uh, that Richard Dawkins had with... Uh, uh, Richard Swinburne, the theologian, um, that what's the point of invoking a god to explain the universe? We might just as well accept the universe. And uh, Swinburne's answer was, it's simpler to expect uh, to accept an omnipotent god mm -hmm. uh, who then created the universe. That's a simpler explanation uh, to which uh, Richard replied, if I remember correctly, um, uh, well, uh, the, the creator would have to be at least as uh, complex as the system it created. Um, and so words like simplicity and complexity get banded around, and the question is, what is a simple explanation? And we're back to Occam's razor. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a whole branch of mathematics called algorithmic information theory, uh, which uh, in part was invented to quantify uh, the uh, simplicity or the complexity of explanations of the world. And if you believe in Occam's razor, then you would believe that uh, we should opt for the one that is simplest. And so the simplicity argument is a good one. If you think, oh, yes, a single super being is a simpler thing to believe in than an than a, a infinity of universes, uh, most of which are unseen, um, you know, then you can make that argument. But the point is we can actually quantify this. You could take... Um, uh, in, in principle, anyway, you could take a, your favorite model of God. You know, this God has the following properties. 
you could quantify. You could work out the algorithmic complexity of this god, and then you could put that alongside, this is my favorite multiverse model, and compare it with the algorithmic complexity of that. And, and I bet you that mostly they come out about the same. Uh, that in other words, there's an awful lot of things you have to sort of take on board. Um, and I don't think, um, at the moment, we've got the right conceptual framework for being able to say, ah, this explains all of existence because this is so obviously simple in a measurable way, much simpler than the others. So I, you know, I think it's an open question that could be uh, literally investigated in a quantitative way as to you know, who, who, which is the greater leap of faith, mm. uh, an unseen, uh, uncreated, uncaused agent uh, with the power to create a universe or an infinite number of universes. So they both, there's both an awful lot of uh, information that, uh, that has to go into that. Uh, so so that's, that interests me. So I, uh, I, and I'm open, I often say two cheers for the multiverse, because the reason it's so appealing to so many of my colleagues is it explains the weird biofriendliness of the universe. It does look like, often called the anthropic principle, it looks like the universe is rigged in favor of life. There are many examples, I uh, won't go through them, but um, the, the feeling is, well, um, this looks too much like design, but if you have an infinite number of universes, then some of them will get it right, and it's a selection effect. The only one, uh, it's no surprise we live in a universe that's biofriendly because we couldn't live in one that's sterile. Right. Um, and so it sort of gets around that, which is, is better, in my view, than just saying, uh, well, God did it. Um, and so I say two cheers for the multiverse, but then people go on and say, well, that's all you need. That explains all of existence. Mm. Uh, and of course, it doesn't, because when you've got a multiverse, it needs its own laws. And usually uh, the laws are, involve quantum mechanics and gravitation and all those things in the multiverse. Where do they come from? <laughs> right. um, so you're really pushing the problem up a level. So it's, a, it's sort of an improvement on just sort of declaring there was a God, there's one universe. But I think uh, it's... It, 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 it's a mirage to suppose it's explained everything. Right. As a, as a, you know, as an explanatory feature to explain what we do observe to, to actually posit that we have to wait, you know, perhaps billions of years for our universe to eat another universe. Um, as, as you depict them, <laughs> the cover and the, the famous, uh, the famous uh, cold spot and the axis of evil and all sorts of other anomalies that we've been discussing and we could go on for hours and hours more, but I want to be respectful of your time and, uh, and, and you've been so gracious. So what, like to wrap up with the uh, thrilling three questions that I ask all my beloved guests who come on the show. And two of these involve your uh, future, one, your immediate future, or perhaps not immediate, but uh, at age 120. Uh, and then the next one goes out a billion years, and then we're going to go and actually go back to your past. So I'm going to start, if you will, uh, with a question that I ask, which has to do with what form of wisdom, what value system, what articulation would you like to provide for future generations, uh, biological and ideological, if you will, uh, as an inheritance, a sort of ethical will uh, that would be coming into effect when you reach the biblical age of 120, hopefully in many, many years from now. So, Paul, what ethical or wisdom teaching, not material um, inheritance, would you leave, but what ethical or wisdom Advice would you leave as an inheritance to the millions of people who look up to you for, for wisdom and advice? Well, I'm going to say something uh, which doesn't seem uh, very profound, um, but is actually very important. And I think we all learned it uh, during the pandemic, uh, that we have to be nice to one another. Mm. And I've, uh, through my life, uh, I was born just after World War II and uh, uh, the horrors of Nazi Germany and then the horrors of the Soviet Union and in China the uh, uh, the um, Great Leap Forward the, the Great Leap Forward and it's Great Leap Backward uh, and all of those things and then uh, you know for a decade or two it looked like the world really was moving into the sunny uplands and that we were uh, that democracy was spreading and that uh, uh, um, impressed by Steven Pinker's uh, book that, you know, we're actually getting less violent, less wars and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And now just in the last few years, uh, it all seems to be going backwards. And I, mm -hmm. and I, I really, and this, I, this homily, uh, we've got to be nice to one another, um, served us very well. So my wife and I um, 
found ourselves in a somewhat happy situation. We were in uh, Sydney. We went for a week for spring break and we stayed mm -hmm. a year because of the lockdown and the, and the uh, travel ban and, uh, and there was so little COVID in Australia, it was a good place to be. Um, but, you know, if ever we would uh, squabble about something, uh, you know, who's going to wash the dishes, uh, I, I would always say, we're, you know, we're in a lockdown, we've got to be nice to one another. That's really important. And, uh, and you know, a lot, of, a, a lot of what has happened, I just heard about it today, a lot of domestic violence that has mm. come during the pandemic and so on, stems from the fact that people have forgotten how important it is that if you're, you're living together with someone, and it applies in households, it applies in countries, it applies globally, uh, you really have to go out of your way uh, mm. to be nice to the other side. And, mm. and when we see uh, the sort of, you know, the sabre rattling and the tit for tat uh, violence and all of these things, um, it's such a basic human instinct. You may not agree with somebody else, you may have grievances against them, uh, but um, at the end of the day, we, you know, we're on one planet and we have to learn to live together. Now, you touched upon uh, another topic, which is uh, I think about a lot. And uh, we actually have a meeting coming up at Arizona State University on this uh, very topic, which is that in the age of AI, uh, we're going to try to embed human values mm. uh, into our uh, artificial intelligent descendants. And it's a real problem. Uh, that how we embed those uh, human values in perpetuity, hmm. uh, because these AIs will be generating, the, uh, uh, designing the next generation of AIs and the next generation and making them. Um, is there any way we can enshrine fundamental principles of decency uh, that will uh, perpetuate inde indefinitely? Hmm. Um, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> uh, I, Asimov's famous laws of robotics, you know, uh, were an attempt to... to to state that, but how do we actually do that? Or will these AIs develop their own system of values that could be uh, very different from, from ours? Mm. Um, so uh, talking about the age of 120, I think we're already uh, gonna, we're hitting that problem now. And it, 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 if I were to live to 120, I think it would become a really major issue. Um, now, I'm not sure how wise that is. It's sort of common sense, isn't it, really? Mm. Uh, ra rather than anything terribly profound uh, about uh, human nature, uh, which is obviously deeply flawed. The, the, the other point I would like to uh, make uh, in answer to that, it's to echo uh, E.O. Wilson, mm. who said uh, that we have um, uh, paleolithic emotions and we have medieval institutions and we have 21st century technology. Mm. And that's a dangerous mix. Now, we can't change our human nature much, and we, our technology will be what it will be. We can change our institutions. Mm. It seems to me they're not well suited for many of the problems we confront. And so mm. we, we used to look up to things like, you know, the United Nations or elected governments or the World Health Organization or, you know, the large banks that were sort of oiling the wheels of the system. We've lost faith in yeah. a lot of those institutions, and the church, you know, has been very sullied by uh, sexual abuse, and uh, uh, and celebrities seem to always be, uh, you know, we can't really look up to celebrities, whether it's sports celebrities or film stars anymore, because they, they seem to uh, for, always be getting themselves into trouble. Um, you know, what are the institutions that we can build that can cope with this, uh, with this next challenge. Uh, mm. we, we need new ideas and we need them mm -hmm. now. Yeah, I agree. And, and science used to fill that role and it's dismaying to see science become politicized and, and used and as a cudgel uh, to, to force the certain aspects of uh, state-sponsored uh, agendas, but uh, for good and for bad. Um, that has, uh, has been a little dismaying because it used to be science was apolitical. I always say um, I love astronomy because there are no you know democratic comets and Republican <laughs> asteroids or things like that. But you know, nowadays uh, there is a, <laughs> there is an undergirding of, of uh, politics in almost everything, and that leads to polarization, not of the CMB type that I like, but of the political type. 
next question takes us a little further into the future, and you may remember uh, fellow countryman uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke and his uh, and his movie or his book, The Sentinel, that became the movie 2001: A Space Odyssey, where these monoliths and they're floating around in space sometimes, and first they're encountered on the plains of the African savanna, and uh, we're not really sure what they are. Maybe they're time capsules, maybe they're not. And I wanted to ask you if you had a time capsule, a monolith that would last for a billion years, uh, lurking in our solar system, uh, perhaps, uh, what would you put on it or in it that would encapsulate uh, not just your career, but but the pinnacle of what human beings have achieved, not unlike Richard Feynman's famous cataclysm uh, uh, question. Um, so what would you put on a billion year lasting time capsule to kind of swagger and, and show the, uh, the great heights that humanity has achieved? Well, it's no surprise that I would pick something from the world of theoretical physics because that's what I, I think is such an achievement. Part, not just because we're good at it and we've explained so many things, but because it does touch on what we were talking about earlier, that, you know, is there something like meaning or purpose in the universe? And I said, well, that there is a coherent rational scheme of things that we tap into. Uh, I, the, another way I like to put it is that there's... Uh, like a cosmic code or a hidden and encrypted subtext in nature, which we call the mathematical laws of physics, which you uh, have to work hard to uncover. So I think that our uh, enterprise in uncovering that deeper layer of reality uh, is what is finest about uh, humanity. Now, of course, some people will object and they'll say, but, you know, great works of music or art uh, mm -hmm. surely are more significant. And I'm not decrying those. It's just that if we're leaving a time capsule for an alien mind, the question is, what would it mean? Uh, it always seemed to me that if we were to communicate with the aliens, there'd be no point in sending them the latest football scores or the outcome of somebody or other's election or anything like that. It would mean nothing and be of no interest anyway. Uh, but if we were to send uh, the fine structure constant uh, in binary, uh, they would know we attained a certain level of understanding of uh, quantum mechanics and uh, electromagnetism and so on. So it would convey an awful lot. Mm. So it depends whether this time capsule is to, supposed to represent the finest achievements of humanity, uh, which uh, would mean nothing to an alien mind, or whether we're trying to really communicate, uh, look, we got this far. Uh, this is something you can surely understand. And, that, right. uh, and that's where we got to. Very nice. And the final question in the troika of questions has to do with the far distant past, if you will. And that harkens back to our namesake, Arthur C. Clarke's famous uh, third law that uh, the only way to discover the limits of the possible is to venture beyond them into the impossible. So I want to ask you, Paul, uh, what advice would you give to your former self, a 20-year-old Paul, uh, et cetera? What would you give advice-wise to give him the courage to go as you've gone into the impossible? Uh, it, uh, that's uh, an excellent question. And I often think about this. Uh, I often, uh, in my mind, you know, send a little message back in time to that, uh, you know, poor, bewildered, uh, you know, frightened child trying to make sense of the world. I mean, the world is is frightening to, to a child. And, um, uh, and when I embarked on a scientific career, it was a huge risk. Mm. Uh, my family, I, I was the first in our family, even the extended family, aunts and uncles and so on, uh, ever to go to university. So that in itself was a big departure. Uh, but becoming a scientist, a physicist, you know, I don't think there was anyone in my family who knew what physics was. <laughs> um, and so, uh, uh, really, this was a very lonely venture, and I thought, well, is this foolhardy? Uh, am I going into something that would lead nowhere? And my parents were very anxious that I should, uh, you know, quit the university and uh, go work for a large company that would provide <laughs> me with a decent pension. Um, and, and for them, uh, stability was the important mm. thing. The idea that you would... Uh, uh, my father worked in the same job for 40 years. Uh, the idea that you'd switch jobs, switch careers, switch countries, you know, was completely outside their uh, experience. And so I was uh, doing something which looked a bit scary and which didn't have a lot of support, a lot of encouragement. And I suppose I would say to my young self, um, well, be adventurous, be bold. Because, I, you know, there were a few times when I thought, well, I, you know, this is going to lead nowhere, but I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> 
And so I sort of hung in there, and, and by good luck, um, uh, we talked about it, good fortune, I picked the right topics, I picked the right places to work, the right colleagues, and I soldiered on. Uh, but it was a worrying, I think all young people, I mean, it's not just when you're a child, the university is scary, but people embarking on their early career, you know, the PhD, postdoc, that sort of phase, will they ever settle down, or can they buy a house, have a family? Those sorts of things, very daunting. And so mm. to my younger self, I would say, well, don't be too, you know, just stick to your guns. Mm. It'll all come right in the end. But of course, for many of my colleagues, it didn't come right in the end. They quit and they went into other, other fields. But I think they've all done very well. Tim Bunch, we were just talking about Tim yeah. earlier, the Bunch Davies vacuum. And uh, Tim, uh, after his PhD, I think he did one postdoc, and then he, he left the field and went into the financial services sector. I've lost touch with him these days. Um, I'm sure he's made a good, uh, good so, career. It's creating virtual money out of the vacuum. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> well, I hope he sends you a bunch of money, yes, Paul, because well, you, that, that's, that's <laughs> you deserve it. Um, it's been such an honor talking with you, as it always is. You're so gracious all the times we get together. Uh, you are a cosmic mensch. If the multiverse exists, I only hope it does, so there'll be plenty of you to go around. Uh, Paul Davies, congratulations on this phenomenal book, What's Eating the Universe and Other Cosmic questions a delightful delicious uh, uh treat uh, for the mind and soul i should say as well paul thank you so much for joining us on into the impossible well brian thank you and uh, for your uh, huge interest and support for my endeavors any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic Thank you.